Well, I hope this message today encourages all of you and maybe even challenges some of you. So, uh, with that being said, can we please turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to be reading from uh, verse 19 to 23 as an introductory uh, verse into this message this morning. Verse 19 begins and it says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us unward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet, and gave to him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. Lord, thank you for each and every person here. Lord, I pray for the message uh, that goes out today, Lord, that it touches not only our minds, Lord, but our hearts as well. Lord, I pray that you hide me behind uh, your cross this morning. Uh, that uh, this message can touch and convict uh, all those here today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the full title of my message this morning is Christ the Lord in a Godless Culture. And as I was doing some more deep diving into this topic, I came across someone by the name of Abraham Kuyper. I hope I pronounced his name right. Abraham was a former Prime Minister of the Netherlands in the year 1901 to 1905. Now, in some ways, his theology was a bit different to what we believe here at Faith Baptist Church, but some of the things that he was dealing with in his day still ring true over a hundred years later, even into today. Abraham was so distressed by the culture of his time, and I mean, uh, given the state of the Netherlands today and how secular it is, I don't really blame him uh, for his concern. But he was concerned about both the the sin and the depravity amongst the non-Christians at the time, as well as the ignorance of Christ's kingship and authority among the believers. And he writes this, he says, The European population that calls itself Christian profits legally and socially from Christianity, but fails in confession to walk even the slightest bit of reverence for Christ. Now, just before we move on, how does society profit from Christianity legally and socially? Now, there's no denying that a society that functions based on Christian principles um, functions well. And our country, no matter how secular it's become, is still held together more or less by those fundamental principles. So how how does society profit from Christianity? Well, for starters, our legal system, our system of morals. How about the notion of private property and ownership? All these uphold the idea that ultimately all things belong to God And so the state must answer to something that's ultimately higher than itself. And so when that idea is abandoned, then all you're left with is a system where the state is God. And as you've seen in history, that's obviously a very dangerous thing. What about the separation of church and state? Well, you can thank the Christians for that. Although technically secular society has now taken that concept to mean the idea of separation of church and God. Uh, which isn't what it was intended for at all, but rather that both institutions should be separate and have separate roles and functions, but still be accountable to Christ. So, for example, the church was, you know, not to act as the hand of justice issuing out, you know, capital punishment. And likewise, by the same token, the state was not to be responsible for, I guess, affairs relating to the church. But both, both our entities were still to be governed according to a biblical worldview. And so let's continue. So as for the Christians, Abraham writes, he says, and this is really the the crux of it. He says, they withdrew from the breadth of life's activities in order to continue their life of piety and isolation and quiet rest. This made it seem as if the power of nature, the power of science, richer economic development and the treasures of art were to be abandoned to the world as it dwelt in wickedness. And as if Christianity had nothing to do except to bemoan the ruins of Zion's walls and wait, uh, and await the return of Christ and the end of all things. In this day and age, it's so easy to want to live in isolation and quietness and rest, just waiting you know, until Christ comes back, all in the, in the name of safety. We've almost put this idea of safety on this altar and we just it's almost like the God of safe. We just 
We want to do everything to just escape and just wait for Christ to come back. A lot of Christians, we act like we're fighting a losing battle. But every word in the New Testament stands in opposition to that idea. And that's why all the apostles and all the heroes of the faith were able to go to their deaths with such a fire and passion and peace within them. Because they had a correct view of Christ as Lord and as King. We, we may not verbalize this, but I'm sure this has crossed all our minds at least once. It's crossed mine. You know, things are only going to get worse, you know. Why not just let things run their course so that maybe Christ can come back sooner or something like that. You know, it's almost like being on a very long flight and just trying to sleep through it all so that time can just pass quicker. So we can get to the destination and, and you know, then start to enjoy ourselves. As Christians, though, we're not called to sleep through the flight. Instead, we're called to engage and confront the culture that we're living in all to his glory. It's easy to have this mindset of escapism. Just, you know, we just want to leave this physical world and just, you know, be with him and enter the spiritual and just leave all these physical things behind because it's all bad. And actually, if you take that to its extreme, it almost becomes an agnostic idea. So we have to be very careful to say that anything physical is bad and everything spiritual is suddenly always good. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have hope and wait for Christ's return. As Christians, we absolutely should. And we should eagerly await it at that. But we still have a job to do on this earth while we're here. And things may get worse. There's no denying that. But we're not called to cower away while things crumble around us. And when we properly understand, not just in our heads, but in our hearts as well, that Christ rules as King, then suddenly the world becomes a lot easier to engage. Life gets a lot easier to navigate through because ultimately it all belongs to him. It's all his. And so in our Western world, there's, there's a big war at the moment for ideologies and politics and, and morality in, in this day and age, all, all that kind of stuff. And the idea of Christ's rule in our world today is such a foreign concept. It's something that not a lot of people can grasp or fathom uh, in today's culture. Our culture today instead is very big on spirituality and mysticism. Even a lot of common day-to-day -day practices like, you know, mindfulness or, you know, the ideas of moral relativism are actually rooted in New Age thinking. And these ideas have taken our culture completely by storm. There's a scholar who goes by the name of Dr. Peter Jones, who's an expert on neo-paganism, especially in the West. And he explained the Western problem perfectly. When you break it down to its core, there are essentially two fundamental belief systems. He says there's oneism and then there's twoism. And this is what he says. He says, the Western Christian soul has been profoundly and definitively altered by Eastern spiritual oneism, the seductive message of which is bound up in the Hindu word Advaita, meaning not two. Here is the massive clash of two fundamentally opposed worldviews, whereas, whereas scripture affirms a theological binary, twoism, that is the uh, creator creation distinction there's a there's a distinction between the creation and the creator and there's a wall there's a there's a a wall there that that will never be broken down whereas scripture affirms a theological binary hinduism categorically affirms that things are not two but things are one that is you know uh everything's one we're one with mother nature god is in everything god can be in that camera uh in, in a rock he's in us as well there's there's no longer a distinction and without in, in a cosmos without a creator all distinctions collapse and man is god and that that philosophy has taken our culture completely by storm you even see it in things like gender today the, re the rejection of the binary of what is inherently male or female and then you know these people will often identify themselves then as non-binary it affects every part of life and so that, that, that philosophy is influenced over so many things today. And so because of all that and, and many more things as well, the Christ of scripture has been so reduced and diluted. And we've built for ourselves, you know, this version of Christ who exists almost purely just to serve us, you know, as if Jesus should revolve, revolve himself around us rather than us revolving our lives around him. Or if it's not that, then we've developed for ourselves this Jesus who's almost this kind of hippie kind of a character or this soft passive you know and you know we, when we try and speak to people we might say you know oh jesus is going to be your best friend or you know just just give jesus a chance J just just try him out you know give him a 90 day trial 
you're not happy, we'll give you your money back. But he isn't some genie or something that you just turn to when you want something. The Christ of Scripture is so much more than that. But rather, there's nowhere where Christ's rule does not touch. Whether it's the law or the government or our jobs or our families or our thoughts. So, with all that said, you're a Christian living in a godless world who cares very little about Christ. And if they do, it's often this version of Christ who's portrayed often as this weak kind of saviour. So, how did the Christians in Christ's day understand Christ's lordship and his kingship? And more importantly, how did, it affect, how did it affect the way that they lived? How did the writers of the New Testament view Jesus' authority, not just over them, but also the world that they were living in? The Jesus we see in Scripture is a very different one to what's portrayed in today's culture, and even some sects of Christendom as well. So, let's turn to a couple of passages just to lay a basic foundation and, you know, let's see how some of the apostles view the Christ of Scripture or how they describe him. So let's look at Paul just to start off with. We won't go through too many, but just because it's countless, but we'll just have a look at some. So turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Let's see what Paul has to say about Christ. I see why you need the, uh, the drinks at the front. Sometimes your voice gets a little uh, sore. Alright, Colossians chapter, 16, uh, sorry, chapter 1 verses 16. It says, For by Him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. That is, all things literally have their being in Him. No other version of Christ can make that claim. Not the Christ of Mormonism, not the Christ of Jehovah's Witnesses, Islam, none, none, none of it. This verse literally tells you that you wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be here, no throne would be here, no principality would be here, no power would be here apart from Him. And the fact that it was made by Him means that it was also made for Him as well. And Paul was so impacted by Christ's preeminence that it showed through every part of his life to the point where initially he hated Christ with everything that he was and he even sought to persecute and to kill Christians. And then something changed on the road to Damascus. Then many years later, that same person who hated Christ initially was able to say the words to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that's a whole sermon in and of itself, so we won't get, get into that, but I'm saying all that to make a point to say that Paul actually said it's actually better if I die because if I die I get to be with him but while I'm alive on this earth Christ is all I live for that's a very powerful statement and I hope one day I can reach the point where I can say those words admittedly I'm not sure if I'm if I'm there yet either how about the Apostle John let's go to the Gospel of John John chapter 12 now the Apostle John lived with Christ, walked with Christ for some time. Obviously, he had some unique insight and he had you know, very strong beliefs as to, to who this person he was traveling with was. And he, he writes about him in John chapter 12, verses 37 to 41. Verse 37 says... But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Esaias, which is a way of saying Isaiah, so the saying that the saying of Esaias the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spake of him. Now, Isaiah is talking about Jesus there. So, when did Isaiah see God's glory? Well, he saw his glory, as most of you know, in, in Isaiah chapter 6. And you, you don't have to turn there, but Isaiah chapter 6 says, you know, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train filled the temple. Above stood it the seraphim, 
Each one had six wings. With twain, he covered his face. With twain, he covered his feet. And with twain, he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So if you ask Isaiah, Isaiah, who did you see uh, on that throne? Don't forget, this was 700 years before Christ. If you ask Isaiah, Isaiah, who did you see? Isaiah will say, oh, I saw God. I saw, I saw Jehovah. But if you ask the apostle John, John, who did Isaiah see on that throne? Oh, sorry, on that throne receiving worship by the angels. John would say Isaiah saw Jesus on that throne. And so the apostles of Jesus day viewed Christ's rule and his kingdom as a victorious one. However, it played out. They had such conviction, even when it resulted in most of their deaths. So we've looked at the apostles. How about Christ? How did Christ publicly identify himself or make himself known to the people around him? Turn with me to Mark chapter 14, verses 62. Now, this is the, this is the scene where um, Christ is before the Sanhedrin. He's, he's at the, his trial before he's, he's condemned and crucified. And at that time, they had uh, various witnesses to come and, and accuse Christ of things. But... Uh, they their testimonies weren't aligning. They weren't really co corroborating. So they said, "Okay, let's let's ask him straight. You know, let's see if he will give us an answer. You know, are you the Christ?" And they go and they ask him. So sixty-two, and Jesus, this is Jesus' response to them. Jesus said, and there's so much in here, we we can't get into all of it now. But Jesus said, "I am." And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Now, there's so much in there. Obviously, there's a, um, you know, he quotes from multiple passages in the in the Old Testament, which we'll we'll look at some now. The 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 most obvious one there is uh, Psalm chapter 110, verse one, which is uh, ironically the most quoted verse in the in the whole New Testament. It says the Lord, being uh, God, the Lord said unto my Lord. Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So, this, this Lord who sits next to God, he's sitting at the right hand of God and he's given the same power and authority as God himself. That's one passage um, that Jesus was quoting when he made that statement. The other one is Daniel chapter 7. So, turn with me to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13. A lot of people think that, you know, when Jesus is referring to himself as the son of God, he's referencing, you know, his divine nature. Then when he calls himself the son of man, he's somehow re referring to just his humanly nature. But that's not necessarily true. In, um, in a lot of ways, uh, the title son of man is actually a, a pretty divine title, as we'll see in Daniel chapter 7. And the chief priest knew exactly what he was claiming, which is why after that, they yelled blasphemy and then they tore their clothes and convinced him of death, uh, convicted him of death. So Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 to 14 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, which is God, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed. So this son of man uh, a person here receives worship only attributable to God and he's given a dominion and he's given a kingdom that all people and nations should serve and worship him. And Jesus says, that guy in Daniel 7, I'm that guy. He will have a, a kingdom that will not pass away. How about Revelation uh, chapter 19 verse 16? Now this is one that we're all familiar with. This is the scene now where... Uh, uh, Christ is coming back on the white horse and I'm sure this is a uh, you know you've heard this one before it's a uh, tends to be among the Christian cliches if you will but it actually has a lot of deep theological truth Revelation chapter 6 uh, chapter 19 verse 16 sorry my apologies 19 verse 16 It says, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, as I said before, it's a, a verse I'm sure we're all familiar with. It's almost become this cliche, as I said earlier. But 
King of Kings and Lord of Lords means essentially that all kings on earth have to answer to Christ as the ultimate king. And all the lords must subject themselves to Christ as ultimate lord. So in essence, whatever it is that the kings own, whether it's castles or land or whatever it may be, all those things ultimately belong to Christ because he's the king of them. He's, he's their king. And the same thing with the lords. Ultimately, whatever the lords own, whatever they have, it all ultimately belongs to, to Christ because he is their Lord. So everything ultimately belongs to him. So with that being said, how can we as Christians be more vigilant in upholding the truth of Christ's preeminence and Lordship in our lives and then subsequently the world around us? And this one, this initial one is by far the most challenging one to get a hold of. Recognizing his his lordship and his kingship in our thought life, you know when the I don't know who, who was here when the Mackays were here and they and they showed that video. It was any few of us, yeah. When when they were here and they showed that video on the big screen about um when they were in in um, PNG in Papua New Guinea and they were they showed like this video of how you know a day in the life of what it would be like to be you know in one of those tribes and you know their their life just seemed so simple. You know, they, they woke up, the men would kind of go hunting and harpooning and then, you know, the women did their thing. Then afterwards, you know, the kids, you know, were in their own groups and then they got together later. Some of the kids would go to school, you know, others might go to church and then, you know, that was pretty much their day. But I couldn't help but think how simple their way of living was. And in the kind of culture we live in, our thought life is so consumed. We have, we have an abundance of technology and information just coming at us all the time that it's, we, we have to work harder to filter out the things that are not important or the things that are sinful. And so in a sense, in our culture today, we have so much more to deal with in our thought life. So in light of all that, how do we deal with challenges in our thought life? How can we still uphold Christ as Lord even in our thoughts? Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 5 to 6. Verse 5 says, so this is how we're supposed to do it. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So we're called to bring every thought and every vain imagination and every high thing and submit it to Christ, submit it under him to his obedience. Because essentially Christ should be above it all. He should be Lord over our thoughts. And so we're called to every vain thing. We're called to submit ultimately unto him. And submit it unto Christ's obedience. And not only that. But we should also be ready to be vengeful and hateful toward our disobedience. Which is essentially sin. As if you're taking revenge on it. Now I know you know we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. you know, And God says vengeance is his. But in this context here you essentially have permission to be vengeful against your own sin. This is the one time you're allowed to be vengeful against something, which is your own disobedience. But it's not enough that we simply refrain from doing things or thinking certain things. After we lay every vain imagination at Christ's feet, we should then be filling our minds with what is godly and what is good. Philippians 4 tells us that we're to think about the things that are true honest, right, pure, lovely, virtuous, and the things that are worthy of praise. And when we think about those things, God does give us his peace. It's very different to how the rest of the world thinks they, thinks they need to attain peace, you know. They might look to a movie or, you know, to, to drugs or a how-to formula for peace. You know, they might go on certain pilgrimages or you see certain shamans or whatnot. But for the Christian... Christ promises his peace when we think on what is good and when we rest in him. But obviously that's easier said than done and it takes personal discipline and commitment. Which is why I said this is by far the hardest one of what we're going to go through today. But 
the rest of our lives will, will, be, will be based around how we submit our thoughts to the obedience of Christ. How about in our workplaces, in our day-to-day -day work lives? Do we make an effort to witness to others? Can people tell that our lives are different? You know, with a lot of cultural ideas now influencing our workplaces, are we standing firm in our faith? Or is there some compromise? Is Christ ultimate? What if it means losing your job if you don't do a certain thing, or affirm a certain thing, or say a certain thing? Most people these days don't really care who or what you worship, as long as you acknowledge or pay respect to this thing or that thing, or, or affirm this thing or that thing. You know, in the, in the first century, it wasn't so different. The Romans in the first century didn't really care who you worship. They were, they were pagans. They had plenty of gods. As long as you acknowledge Caesar as the ultimate Lord. Because there was a lot of emperor worship going around back then. And so everyone would, would you know, essentially pay their homage to Caesar. But the Christians often refused. And so the Romans... They encouraged the Christians just to offer a tiny little pinch of incense to the emperor um, and then they wouldn't be put to death. Just the tiniest pinch. They, they would say to them, look, you can have Jesus, you can have your God, that's fine. Just give us this much to Caesar and we'll let you live. That's all it took. And that's why so many Christians were put to death. They didn't compromise their faith even for the tiniest pinch of incense. To them... Caesar wasn't Lord, Christ was Lord. And that's all that that's all that there was and nothing else mattered. How about striving to do well in our jobs? Because it, it does bring God glory when we strive to do well. No matter what kind of job you have, whether you're a lawyer or a doctor or a barista or a cashier or a garbage collector, do you strive to do well? Or do you kind of just... You know do the bare minimum and get in and out with this you know mopey attitude and sometimes i've been guilty of that too in the past but do we have a strong work ethic because because in our workplaces that's also a testimony and when we do well or when we strive to do well when we have a good work ethic that does bring glory to christ and it pleases him how about in witnessing where do we put christ's lordship in the way we witness Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3.15. This is another one I'm sure you're all familiar with. First Peter chapter 3 verses It says, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So step one, first of all, before anything else, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. In other words, put him in his rightful place first. Get that part sorted and get that out of the way and then be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you. That means when the time comes, Give an answer for the hope that is within you. Be clear with your answers. I encourage you, don't cower away. And don't pretend neutrality either with the person that you're speaking with because they're not neutral either. When you come into discussions, everyone comes in with personal biases. And the Bible says that uh, we, by nature, we're enemies of God. We don't want Him in our thinking. So they're, they're not coming into a conversation neutral either. So don't start with man as the center and then try and reason your way back to God. You know, perhaps if I show them maybe this piece of information, then perhaps I can reason them just a little bit closer, then a little bit closer. And finally, with your mighty intellect, you might be able to convince them that maybe some higher power exists. Well, it'll send you to hell anyway. Because without the blood of Christ, they're still not his children. And of course, facts and evidences are good and they help and we should use them. Don't get me wrong. But they should always be used in conjunction with Christ as the ultimate foundation and not secular human thinking. Wherever there's discussions or arguments with non-believers or, you know, witnessing or whatever it may be, at the end of the day, it's a worldview issue. It's not an issue of facts and evidence. It's an issue of how you view the world. So don't sacrifice your worldview 
for that purpose. If what the Bible says is true, then that must be your starting point always. Don't give up your foundation and don't take Christ off his rightful place either when you're witnessing and put him in an interrogation room. And when you start witnessing like this, you might even, you know, attract the kind of questions or the kind of requests that say, you know, um, you know, prove to me God exists without using the Bible. Has anyone heard that before? I've heard that many times. To that I say, prove to me reason exists without using reason. You can't do it. The laws of logic, the scientific method of induction, the laws of physics, objective moral standards wouldn't exist apart from Christ. Now let's go on back to Colossians chapter 1, which we read earlier. He's the only way that you can make sense of the world around you. So we should witness in a way that honors him. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Matthew 28, verse 18. This is now where Christ has been crucified and he's resurrected and he's about to ascend to heaven. And he, now he's here giving the great commission. And verse 18, it says, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. So when Christ arose and was given the great commission before he ascended into heaven, he didn't just say, Go and teach the nations. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. In other words, because all power and authority on heaven and on earth, not just in heaven, but in earth as well, has now been given to Christ with that same mind and with that same spirit, go therefore and teach the nations to observe whatsoever he has commanded us to observe. We should, we should be witnessing with the mind and with the spirit that all authority has been given to him. And we should go with that same courage and, and strength and, and mind. How does Christ's Lordship affect the way that we hope for the future? This is our, our final point. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15 verses 24. Now, this is one of those unique passages where it's very hard to pinpoint an exact verse because often each new verse doesn't really start at the start of a new topic, but it just continues off the, the next one. But verse 24 says, Then cometh the end when he, which is Christ, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So once Christ has defeated all of his enemies and has put them under his feet, he will give it back to the Father and say, there you go, Father, it's all done. And as Christians, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now lives in us. One day there's not going to be any tears of pain or sickness or disease or death. Everything will be perfected as it should be because Christ conquered death for us. And one day we can all say, as Paul said in a, a few verses down, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And this is another thing actually that we discussed in the young adults last week and the month prior as well. We discussed and we had a conversation about it. What's the difference between the hope of a Christian and the hope of the rest of the world? The hope, the difference is the hope that a Christian has is a sure thing, right? It's different from wishing that something will come to pass. You know, I, I hope we go to the movies tomorrow. Or if, if you meet someone, you know, you might say, I hope we can meet again. But for the Christian, it's not like that. Rather, it's looking forward to something you know will come to pass. Because of who Christ is, and because he's now sitting at the right hand of the Father, you can be sure that what Christ starts, he will finish, 
and we can hope in his promises. So hope is a sure thing in the Christian faith. We've already won. And again, a lot of us are acting like we're just fighting a battle where we've already lost. But yet, it's, it's the contrary because the rest of the world doesn't have the same hope that we do. But we still have a job to do before he returns. So, just to wrap things up. What do we gain by affirming Christ as Lord and King? As Christians, we can engage our culture fully when we realize that Jesus is truly Lord over all things. Christians can be a part of the world of art because Jesus rules over it. They can be credible scholars because Jesus created the world that we study. They can be fearless, realizing that their faith cannot die out because Jesus is their Lord and their Master. All of this is possible because Christ rules over art and over science and over everything else, even in places where Christians are most attacked. So really, what, what's at the heart of this message is doing all things to the glory of Christ. So lastly, to wrap up, let's turn our Bibles to Philippians chapter 2, which is the passage that this morning for us. And again, this is a passage that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. But we're not going to read the whole chapter. We'll just read from verses 5 to 11. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now, Paul actually quotes from the book of Isaiah 45 in that last part, where um, God is talking in, in Isaiah. You don't have to turn there. But it says, you know, in verse 23, he says, I have sworn by myself, the, war, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. And so Paul takes those words written 700 years before Christ and then applies them to Jesus in the book of Philippians. And the beautiful thing about this passage, uh, and I shared this again with the young adults, not last time, but uh, the month prior, that verses 5 to 11 is actually most likely a hymn from the early church that was already known amongst the Christians of that day. And it's commonly referred to as the Carmen Christi, which is the hymn to Christ as God. So Paul uses that hymn as an example in the book of Philippians. He says, let this mind be in you. So he's, he's trying to encourage the Philippians in humility. And he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Then he quotes the hymn, who being in the form of God. And it, it's, it's a song that the Christians knew um, back in that day. And actually, this is a bit of a side note here. But this completely debunks the theories out there that say essentially that the person of Christ became, uh, became divine over time. You know, the, there's an idea, and I read this in a library once many years ago, but the idea that Jesus actually started as kind of just a man and then over the course of you know many years his followers kind of began exalting him higher and higher and then eventually he was this he started off as this man and by the end he was suddenly viewed as this son of God um, and I, I read a criticism as well that you know when you read Jesus apparently in the book of Mark um, you know he's, he's portrayed as this lowly man that by the time you get to Matthew Luke and John uh, because Mark is considered by most the first gospel read and then John is the last. But by the time you get from Mark to John, there's this apparently this stark contrast where Christ is more human in one than in the other Christ is, is divine. But it completely debunks the idea because Philippians was written some 30 years you know, after, after Christ. But if this hymn was already circulating around during that time, uh, proclaiming that Christ was equal with God and and God became incarnate and condescended to us, then that, I mean, that whole thing is completely debunked. But that was just a side note I thought I'd throw in there anyway. Found it quite interesting. And I digress a bit, but the point is of Philippians chapter 2 is that 
every knee will bow to Jesus to acknowledge him as Lord. The question is not if you'll bow the knee, but the question is when you'll bow the knee. Because it says every knee will bow. Not, not, not just the Christians, but every knee. So for those here who don't know Christ, and I mean the true biblical Christ of Scripture, not the Christ of the New Age, or the cool hippie Jesus, or the Jesus of Islam, or any other Jesus, but the true Christ, bow the knee to him today before it's too late. He is a powerful Saviour, and his blood will cleanse you from all sin. For those who do know him, I challenge you, are there areas in your life that you have yet to fully give to him? Are there any fears you may have of persecution, ridicule? Remember that it's all his at the end of the day. So don't cower away hiding, waiting for the world to burn. We have a job to do. So live in the freedom that Christ has given you and do all things to his glory. Thank you.